So it's election day. Cue screaming. If you'd like a break from the barrage of politics this week, here's one train fact for every U.S. president. George Washington was the name of a Cincinnati to D.C. overnight streamliner operated by the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad between 1932 and the start of Amtrak in 1971. This train was advertised with the iconic slogan, Sleep Like a Kitten. John Adams' face adorns a variety of collectible model boxcars by the likes of Lionel and Micro Trains. These run between $15 and $65 on eBay. Thomas Jefferson was president when Richard Trevithick debuted the world's first steam locomotive in England, and according to his letters, Jefferson was intrigued by the potential of steam power. James Madison's Montpelier estate in Virginia didn't get a railroad station until long after his presidency in 1910, when the Southern Railway began stopping there. The station was restored in 2010 as part of an exhibit on the Montpelier estate, showcasing the dark realities of Jim Crow segregation. James Monroe lends his name to the town of Monroe, Ohio, which is served by the Lebanon, Mason, and Monroe Railroad, a modern heritage service. The John Quincy Adams locomotive, built by the BNO in 1835, is the oldest American-built locomotive preserved in the U.S. It's now on display at Carillon Park in Dayton, Ohio. Andrew Jackson was the first president to ride a locomotive-hauled train, traveling from Baltimore to Ellicott's Mills on the B&O Railroad in June 1833. Martin Van Buren was president in 1838, when three state chartered railroads in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware merged to form the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad, which now forms a part of the Northeast Corridor. William Henry Harrison was the first presidential candidate to give speeches from the back of a train, when he did so during his unsuccessful campaign in 1836, and the first to travel to his inauguration by train in 1841. John Tyler called for the regulation of the rail industry in 1841, realizing the fledgling field had a monopoly on express routes for the U.S. Postal Service. During James K. Polk's presidency, the U.S. negotiated a treaty with the Republic of New Granada, today's Colombia, which eventually facilitated the construction of the Panama Canal and its accompanying railway. Zachary Taylor led the drive for a transcontinental railroad and recommended a reconnaissance mission of the proposed northern and southern routes. The 1851 completion of the Erie Railroad prompted Millard Fillmore and his cabinet to ride the very first train from New York City to Lake Erie. That guy must have been a foamer. Under Franklin Pierce, Zachary Taylor's reconnaissance mission became reality in 1853. Hundreds of soldiers, scientists, surveyors, and artists were sent across the unknown western territories to find a railroad route to the Pacific. It was during James Buchanan's presidency that the Atchison and Topeka Railroad Company, forerunner of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, was chartered in Kansas in February 1859. Abraham Lincoln's funeral train was the first national commemoration of a president's death by rail. Lincoln was observed, mourned, and honored by citizens and visitors in 13 cities. In Illinois, it used the right-of-way now used by Amtrak's Lincoln service. During Andrew Johnson's presidency, the locomotive known as the John Bull retired from active service on the Camden and Amboy Railroad in 1866. Today, you can see it on display at the Smithsonian Museum of American History. Ulysses S. Grant oversaw the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, although he threatened to withhold federal funding until the two companies building the railroad could agree on a meeting point. He then attended the famous Golden Spike Ceremony in Utah, where the Central Pacific and Union Pacific were finally connected. Rutherford B. Hayes was president during the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, the first strike that spread across multiple states in the U.S., which he ended by calling in the army against the railroad workers. It remains the deadliest conflict between workers and strikebreakers in American history. James A. Garfield was assassinated by a delusional office worker at the former Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station in D.C. Chester A. Arthur worked as a lawyer before his presidency. In 1855, he argued the case of a black woman who had been kicked off a Manhattan streetcar because of her race. This case played a major role in desegregating the city's rail transit. During his first term, Grover Cleveland signed off on the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1887, a government body that would regulate the railroads until 1995. Benjamin Harrison signed the Railroad Safety Appliance Act on his last day in office. This was a sweeping piece of legislation to protect railroad workers' safety by mandating the use of safer rail equipment, including automatic couplers and air brakes. This would take effect in 1900. Before we continue, I wanted to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters, who get early access to videos and bonus content. Right now, they can enjoy my first video from my Europe trip. Grover Cleveland famously intervened in the 1894 Pullman strike during his second term, 
when the American Railway Union launched a boycott against all trains with Pullman cars. To keep the railroads moving, he ordered the army to stop strikers, leading to violence and angering labor unions nationwide. President-elect William McKinley launched a train in January 1897, dubbed the largest single shipment of a manufactured commodity ever made. This 162-car five-engine Worcester Salt Special Train carried over 5 million pounds of Worcester Salt over the Erie Railway and the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad. Theodore Roosevelt was famous for his whistle-stop campaigns. He was the first president to use a train exclusively for his campaign staff, and delivered 673 speeches from it while traveling more than 21,000 miles. As a federal judge, William Howard Taft supported the right of labor to organize and strike, ruling against employers. In the case of Voigt v. Baltimore and Ohio Southwestern Railway Company, he ruled in favor of a worker who was injured in a railroad accident. Unfortunately, his decision was reversed by the Supreme Court in 1900. In 1917, Woodrow Wilson issued an order for the federal government to nationalize the entire railroad system during World War I to ensure the transport of troops, arms, and material was given priority. During its legal monopoly, more than 100,000 railroad cars were built, using standardized designs, and an estimated $1 billion was invested in transportation systems. Warren G. Harding was president during the Great Railroad Strike of 1922, when seven of the 16 railroad labor unions went on strike on July 1st, adding up to 400,000 workers. In 1927, Calvin Coolidge left D.C. by train for an extended vacation to South Dakota's Black Hills, and this resulted in many Americans heading to the Black Hills to see Coolidge. In Herbert Hoover's hometown of West Branch, Iowa, people can walk along the Hoover Nature Trail, which follows the railroad that passed through the president's hometown. Franklin D. Roosevelt traveled by rail for nearly 250,000 miles over 399 trips during his 12 years in office, the equivalent of 10 trips around the world. He was the first president to have a train pulled by diesel locomotives in place of steam. In response to an impending national rail strike in May 1946, Harry S. Truman seized the railroads in an attempt to contain it. When two key unions struck, it immobilized 24,000 freight trains and 175,000 passenger trains a day. In a speech to Congress, Truman called for a new law where strikers would be drafted into the military. However, by the time he was done with his address, he was told the strike had been settled on presidential terms. Nevertheless, a few hours later, the House voted to draft the strikers, but the bill died in the Senate. The National Railroad Museum outside Green Bay, Wisconsin is home to the only British-built Class A4 steam locomotive in the U.S., the Dwight D. Eisenhower. It was originally built for the London and Northeastern Railway in 1937 as the Golden Shuttle, but was renamed after Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1946, retired in 1963, and made its way to Wisconsin in 1964. John F. Kennedy lends his name to both New York City's largest airport and its respective airport people mover system, the AirTrain JFK. Under Lyndon B. Johnson, Congress passed the Urban Mass Transportation Act of 1964. This led to state-of-the-art metro systems like BART, the Patco Speed Line, and the DC Metro. After Penn Central's bankruptcy in June 1970, Richard Nixon signed the Rail Passenger Service Act into law in October of that year. This created Amtrak, which launched in 1971. Gerald R. Ford dedicated the American Freedom Train in 1974. This was a traveling exhibit of American history and artifacts that would tour the country for the next two years. Jimmy Carter's hometown of Plains, Georgia is served by excursion trains on the Savannah, Americas, and Montgomery Railroad, which heavily advertises its connection to the former president. Ronald Reagan's administration viewed Amtrak as a waste of federal dollars and threatened to cut funding for the carrier. Thankfully, Amtrak survived his administration. In 2005, the Union Pacific Railroad unveiled locomotive number 4141, named after George H.W. Bush. This engine pulled him to his final resting place in 2018, from Spring to College Station, Texas, the first presidential funeral train in almost 50 years. The locomotive can now be seen at the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum. Bill Clinton's 1996 re-election bid included a special train to the Democratic National Convention, from which he delivered speeches and waved to passing trackside crowds. George W. Bush was president during the 9-11 terrorist attacks, which destroyed the World Trade Center towers in New York, along with the underground PATH train station. One PATH car that survived the collapse is on display at the Shoreline Trolley Museum in New Haven, Connecticut. Barack Obama's Department of Transportation sent over $2 billion to California for the construction of its high-speed rail network, including $400 million to build the Salesforce Transit Center in San Francisco. 
Donald Trump's rollback of Obama-era safety standards mandating electronic braking for certain types of freight trains was blamed by some for the 2023 train derailment in East Palestine, which caught fire and spilled toxic chemicals into the environment. However, this proved not to be the case. And Trump himself visited the derailment site in the following weeks, criticizing the Biden administration's handling of the situation. Joe Biden has been a lifelong train enthusiast, and after his wife and daughter were killed in a car accident before his first term in the Senate, he chose to live in Delaware and commute to work on Amtrak, earning him the nickname Amtrak Joe. And since some of you are probably watching after the results are called, according to a former Obama-era transportation secretary named Ray LaHood, a second Donald Trump presidency could be a death knell for high-speed rail in America, as Republicans have traditionally been averse to funding these projects, and Kamala Harris helped secure funding for Caltrain's electrification during her time as a senator. And there you go, one train fact for every US president. Huge thank you to Avery for writing a majority of this script. Don't forget to vote, and I'll see you next week. Take care.